talking a lot about beekeeping, a lot about the differences in beekeeping around Australia. So tune in and if you've got questions, put it in the comments below. And, then, and we'll do a little harvest here just because we can and we're seeing plenty of capped honey in that window you're just looking at. So I'm going to turn that key now and get that underway. Now if you just want to harvest a little bit, you can insert the key a small amount or you can insert it a little bit further. And soon we'll be watching that beautiful honey starting to come out of the hive. Now, Cormac, it's a pleasure to have you here today. And it, for those that don't know Cormac, he is a, a, a leading educator. He trains the Canberra Regional Beekeepers. He uh, mm -hmm. keeps bees on Parliament House right here in our, in our capital city. And what have you got up there? You've got some flow hives, you've got... Yeah, we've got flow hives, we've got a foam Langstroth, we've got a top bar hive to show all those different hive types. And we also have two native stingless hives. Um, but because they're stingless, we can have them right in the heart of, uh, of Prime Parliament Minister itself. <laughs> yeah, basically we have them in there. Actually, there was a, it was a turf war and the presiding officers ended up, um, the Speaker of the Chamber ended up pulling rank because he's in fact in charge of the building and he insisted that they be in his courtyard and they're lovely, they're going really well. Fantastic, I love it that we've got these pollinators right at the, the heart of our Australian politics and it's a, <laughs> it's a good place to be working from. <laughs> exactly. And you're also uh, in the fire brigade, are you? So you're, you're no, I'm not in the fire brigade per se. I'm, I'm a, an environmental scientist and one yep. of my jobs is uh, bushfire protection planning. Okay. So that's a, I do a lot of the design of build design of bushfire protection systems around developments and, and houses and communities. Wow. So that's my day job basically. I don't actually get paid for the parliament role. That's, it's pure fun. And it's kind of nice. I mean, I suppose, like a lot of people, bees for me are an escape and a release. So I have a pretty intense job and I need something to sort of chill out. Yeah. And bees are pretty sense. good for that. Bees are well, the lovely thing about bees is that you have to actually put a little bit of effort yeah, into so chilling out. You just go, oh, I'm going into my hives. Yeah. Time to just settle, tune in on them. And it's, it's a conscious effort and I think that skill that beekeepers get of just preparing themselves to go into a hive is a skill that's useful in life anyway. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So there's quite a lot of differences uh, where you are in the country, uh, whether you're in a tropical environment or subtropical environment like this one here, whether you're in the colder parts like in the ACT mm. or right down south in Tasmania. So we're going to be discussing a bit about that so if you've got questions for Cormac, myself or my father Stu then um, fire away put them in the comments below and we're going to be also opening a hive while we're at it to have a look in at the bees so that's another thing stay tuned in we're going to light a smoker and then wander up here we're going to pull the super off the hive and get right into the brood, brood box so if you want to see what that's like stay tuned in So, I'm going to be lighting with my small little lighter here yeah, this morning. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is very fancy. <laughs> it speeds up things a little we bit. We don't have industrial strength lighters, we just use matches and stuff. See, <laughs> I, I find matches are really good because then when you, you've, I, I get the match, but then I snuff it out. And that's my tester if I'm looking for foul brood, if I want to do a matchstick test. Yeah. Um, that's my foul brood test then. This is spectacular. Well. We'll just speed up things a little bit here. This certainly does. But um, obviously, speaking of fire, we've had a little bit of rain, so we're not too worried. But if, you, if we were in a dry time here, you do need to look at what restrictions you might have in your area for using a bee smoker. Yeah, unfortunately, we did have a major incident in Canberra where there was one of the biosecurity hives, and I'm on the biosecurity teams as well. Um, there was a fire from one of those hives from a smoker and it was just the tiniest little amount of, um, of spark started quite a significant fire. So we find we've changed to always have a metal bucket so that when you're lighting a smoker, you've got water in the bucket. Um, you've got, we've got two metal buckets actually, one with water in it 
yeah. then the second one with uh, just a metal bucket so that you're not putting the smoker ever down on the on ground, the ground. Yeah, you're putting it into the bucket or you can also the way I put them down is I lay them onto the onto the bellow so that it's facing up and that way there's no metal part ever touching the ground and starting a spark and that it's was simply so easy because you're focusing on the bees exactly you, you, you sort of you behind you focus on your bees you turn around and the fire's already racing up the paddock it's very very scary i also use foam hives because i run pollination services for an orchard um, and foam hives it's so easy just to put the smoker down on the hive next to you and then <laughs> 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 It's always a it's always a terrible thing when that happens. <laughs> so um, I've never seen a fire started from a bee smoker, but of course it's something you need to be aware of in the dry times. We get out the metal garbage bin as well. I usually use the lid as something to put the smoker on, and then I'll put the lid in front of the hive, sit the smoker on that instead oh, of straight on really the ground, clever. and then you can use the garbage bin to put the smoker in afterwards, so it's completely contained. That's a really clever idea. Of course, you do have to drag the garbage bin around. To it does work well. A little metal paint tin would work as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. So, uh, we're going to be taking there, off please. this super. Yeah. So, first of all, we might take off the roof. I'm going to leave this smoker right at the front of the hive so the bees get a bit of um, a whiff of the smell. Well, I'm then, not to stand on your beautiful plants. Yeah, in order to take off the um, super, there's a little tip here. Window here is a really nice handle. And it's got a handle on the other end and the same on the sides if you wanted to. However, when you're lifting a heavy super, this one's not heavy. But if it was, keeping it in this uh, landscape direction is better because the weight's not so far out. So if we uh, lever off this one here, and we should actually don our bee veils. <laughs> I sometimes forget, we're halfway through beekeeping. But do protect yourself, especially if you're new to beekeeping. Make sure you're wearing a good bee suit, wear your gloves, get used to what beekeeping is all about before you start experimenting with taking your gloves off and things like that. Okay. See, I find with new beekeepers, the best thing about a suit is it's not so much that it protects you from the bees, it just calms you down. Yeah, you okay. totally, I tell people, like, start with all your gear on when you're just starting out. Don't feel as though you need to be macho about it, because the most important thing with inspecting the bees is your sort of your personal state, how, how calm you are, because the bees are incredibly sensitive to how, you know, your mood and your, your how you feel. And when you put that down, make sure you lean it up against something so you're not squashing bees underneath. Well, so here we are. You can see a really bright yellow wax there. Isn't that amazing? Wow, this is gorgeous. We're going to just slowly peel that off. Nice and gentle. In beekeeping, it's good to do gentle, mo slow movements, except for if you're trying to get bees off something. So you can just slowly peel that up and have a look for the queen on the underside just in case sometimes she'll be right there you don't want to orphan her from the hive but just in case we've missed her let's lean that up against the hive so she can walk back in because when she's when she's in egg laying mode she's actually too heavy to fly often mm. although Bees will break rules all the time. I've certainly <laughs> seen them fly as well. I was marking a queen uh, not so long ago to make her easy to see, and she actually flew off out of my hand, and we thought, oh, God, she's gone. And then we actually saw her because she was marked. We saw her fly back in a few moments later. And what we're doing here is adding a little smoke to our hands just to uh, reduce our own uh, pheromone smells. And that way, we're less likely to trigger a uh, better get the mammal response from the bees. <laughs> <laughs> I always say the trick is if you cosplay a bear, they're going to think you're a bear. So try and be as on. Okay. Um, next, we're going to put our harvesting shelf brackets on the side here. And what that'll give us is a nice frame rest. So they're a good little double use item. And all I'm doing is there's a screw I've already wound out a little bit here and just putting them on like that. There we go, we've got a nice frame rest and that'll just be helpful as we inspect. 
this hive. We supered this hive a little bit early, so we weren't expecting a lot of honey yet in the top box. And let's just have a look and see how those bees are going. Now, what I first do is I look in and I see a frame that's going to be the easiest to get out. Once you've got one out, you can start moving in the sideways direction. But before you've, you've got that frame out, you're a little bit limited, so you just want to choose one that's nice and easy to lift. Okay, now sometimes the ones on the edge aren't built out so much, so this is the last frame they did. And I'm looking down and I'm seeing a bit of connection between the frame and the wall, so I'm just going to get my hive tool down there and slice that off. And it should help a little bit as we lift that first frame out. J end goes under the end bar. And then we can come gently, slowly up. So this is the last comb they've drawn from the comb guide. It's amazing when it's fresh like that. You can see the nectar in this area here where they're starting to uh, store their honey. They've even put a few caps on some cells where they're saying the moisture content is low enough to keep and they're storing it for later just like a, a preserving jar in your pantry. So if we turn the frame around... Oh wow, look at that, that's really good. you see a whole lot of capped honey as well. Do you get this yellow wax in Canberra? Very rarely. Yeah, normally we get much whiter wax. Us too. too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> White. I think these ones are on a trip to the M&M factory. I know. Did you hear that story? Yeah, I did, how they picked up the colouring. At the moment, we're getting really purple frames because Patterson's Curse Patterson's is out. Curse, yeah. And the frames. pollen, yeah, the pollen from oh, wow. uh, Patterson's Curse is like a dark purple. So we're getting all these, these purple cells all through the um, all through our frames. It's lovely. Gee, that's beautiful. They're really going well. They are, aren't they? Is this a requeen? Uh, I believe this one we did requeen recently. It was a swarm we caught, and I think um, we requeened this one as well. About three weeks ago. So it'd be good to do an inspection now just to make sure we have a laying queen. So we're, we're bringing the frame across. And if you've got questions for Cormac, myself or my father Stuart, please uh, put them in the comments below and we'll start answering those. For those that are just tuning in, Cormac is a special guest from Canberra. He, he keeps bees, flow hives, native bees, on Parliament House, right at the heart of our, our uh, political centre. And um, he's also an educator One and a hive. catcher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is a small African hive beetle. These are a sneaky, relentless little pest. One nice thing about Canberra is we get deep frost and really, really cold conditions. So they tend to be killed off during winter, but then they'll build up during summer. Um, in northern climes and where you don't have frost, they will slowly build, they actually build up quite rapidly and they can kill your hive. They definitely can slime it out. Yeah, they'll slime it out. So that's, that's an ex beetle now, which is fantastic. There's another one now. What I find is I've got an extraordinary yeah. amount of beetles around my place and they breed up in my compost bin. Yeah. And the hive right close to my house where my compost is gets hit the worst. Mm. But if the hive's strong, they keep it under check. But as soon as the numbers drop low, that's when you have to worry. Yep. When, the, when the bees can't really cover the comb surfaces and protect mm. the hive from beetles laying their oh, eggs. Beautiful, aren't they? <laughs> Look at that comb. Of They're observing this carefully. Up here. Yeah. You don't often see that. They're all lined up, all looking out like they're going, oh. Who are you? Well. <laughs> what oh, we, are you doing? Oh, we told them we had a special guest and they should get organised. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they're all just uh, poking their heads up. A little bit shy today. I think they're retreating back. They've seen gun. This guy's really ugly. <laughs> uh, 
some great questions coming in. Actually, one of the first ones that came in, Cedar, was when you took off that Queen Excluder, people, because it's black. People are saying, is it metal or is it plastic? It's plastic, that one. So um, beekeepers have different preferences. These ones are a plastic um, Queen Excluder and they're UV protected. And the way you get them off is a little bit different to the metal. Just a slow peel means it's nice and gentle with the metal you're slowly trying to get the whole thing to pop up at once. So there's pros and cons. One of the pros of plastic ones is you don't get that gap around the edge for the ants to, to move into. Um, but the, the metal ones do have a more robust feel. So, so uh, it's different strokes for different I find the metal ones, you can use really hot boiling water to clean them off really easily when they get gunked up. That's, nice, um, that's nice really one. handy, so that's an easy, they're easy to clean. But there's, that's not to say it's hard to clean a, pl a plastic one. You just scrape it with a hive tool, that's fine. Fantastic. Um, Cormac, lots of people loving those tips that you mentioned at the start about the smokers, and um, obviously you do a lot of training. So a few of the new beekeepers are saying, well, what sort of legal requirements as a new beekeeper um, do you have to do as well? So most places will have some sort of restriction on uh, open flame and fires during the fire season. You can get an exemption to use a smoker during total fire ban days, but to be honest, I often tell people, why would you want to open a hive then? If there's a total fire ban on, it's yeah. usually it's super hot, it's super windy, you're not gonna have fun, you're gonna be in a heavy suit. It's better to wait until you don't have a total fire ban day. That's the most important thing, because that's when the risk is the highest, and usually when there's a lot of active fires on, so fire is really stretched and they don't want any new ignitions. So that's the main legal requirement. When you have a total fire ban day, don't light your smoker. Don't light anything, basically, yeah. on a total fire ban day. Exactly, and here in Australia, we're pretty on to that at the moment. Yeah, the, the other thing is keeping, keeping the area around your hive clear, especially in, in summer, of, of too many weeds and too much scrub. Um, at the moment in Canberra, we're doing that for a different reason. We've had a few uh, brown snakes move into our training apiary and they do like to sit under the hives because it's warm. Um, they're actually mm -hmm. friendly, but they're, they're, <laughs> they're a little bit too friendly. So they're actually quite tame and they come up to people. Wow. And we keep sort of going, Brown that's snake. lovely, but if one of them has a bad day and bites someone, it mm, will absolutely kill you. Serious. It's very serious. Like it's one of the worst, it's, I think it's number three deadliest snake in the world. Um, um, I've only ever been bitten on the jeans, I've never been envenomated, wow. but I know people that have, and it was a very unpleasant experience. So just keeping, and, and the Flow Hive Mark II is lovely, because you've got these nice tall legs, so you can keep things really clear underneath, it's really nice. It is a classic one, I remember a, a great interview by uh, Richard Beidler, interviewing Murray Arkadiba, an amazing Queensland beekeeper, and uh, Richard asked, what was the most dangerous thing about beekeeping he said brown snakes <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh the the classic hive if you've got some of those just the conventional white box in the paddock usually has a riser about that tall back in front and it sits with a perfect brown snake gap under the hive oh yeah they love it it's and good. the hive it has that beautiful kind of body temperature warmth coming off mm. the brood nest so it's a perfect brown snake home the Flow Hive uh, 2 here has these big legs, which, which is um, unlikely to get snakes hanging out under there, which, which Trace will be very happy about. She's, from, she's a Kiwi from New Zealand, and snakes uh, are, are certainly a um, thing she isn't so used to. Exactly. Um, Another advantage of the Flow Hive while we're plugging it is that you don't need to open it to get the honey, and therefore you don't need your smoker when you're harvesting honey. Yes, actually, hive. that's a. I was, I was harvesting in the conventional way from the Parliament hives on Friday, and they certainly notice. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not they're not dummies. When you're robbing them, they know they're being robbed. Yeah. Cool, Mac, and what about in terms of when you're a new beekeeper, you're just getting a few times. started, um, just with biosecurity laws and registering your hive, and what would you sort of tell new beekeepers and wish that maybe you'd known about when you got started? Oh, look, when I started, which is sort of coming up to 10 years ago now in honeybees, a lot of the products and a lot of the training courses simply weren't available. So the two things I teach new beekeepers is firstly, have a barrier system in your apiary. So you'll see here, obviously I'm a beekeeper, but I didn't bring any gear when I came up here. I'm using flow hive gear from this apiary that doesn't leave this apiary. 
If I had gloves, I wouldn't be using my own gloves. I'm certainly not using my own tool. And that means any diseases from my apiary that might be there are not being transferred to this one. And so that's the really important thing. Don't swap gear from anyone that you don't know. If it basically gear should come out of a box and never touch bees. Um, and then it should only leave your apiary to be cleansed, irradiated, sterilized somehow. And the second thing I would say is Plant Health Australia have this fantastic uh, online course for bee biosecurity. And I think it's 20 bucks and it's just brilliant. You know, it gives you that, that basic how to set up a biosecurity system so that you have a good, a good protection for your apiary. And that's probably the most important thing you could do. Fantastic, a great tip there. This is a good biosecurity course if you want to get in there. It's a, it's, um, it's a great thing to do, learn as much as you can. We've also got a beekeeping course called thebeekeeper.org with experts from around the world. Biosecurity information there as well, lots of training videos. And, um, but yeah, great tip on the, um, the uh, biosecurity course there. We'll, we'll dig out a link and put that in the comments as well. They're really nice and calm on the combs, these ones. Yeah, they are a friendly hive. I thought we'd pick a friendly hive for standing around, seeing my father isn't even wearing shoes. But <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, he said he's wearing pants. That's the main thing. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, I, we did get him to wear pants. So that's good. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, you know, I notice that at certain times of year, certain hives will make this brilliant yellow wax. If you know why, put it in the comments below. And um, I'm quite interested to know where the yellow comes from. See, my guess would be this is pollen being incorporated into it. Because we're seeing a lot of yellow pollens coming out this year. And, um, but yeah, if you see it on the belly, the bees is, is really, really white. If you look down these cells here, you can see some of the pollen that they're bringing in. And um, we've got some beautiful oranges there. We've also got some larvae, young larvae down cells, which is fantastic. You can see them glistening down there. So we know the new queen is happy in this hive and they're away. Cedar, can you do anything with the fur cone that you get from the hive, like melt it down or anything? Uh, you certainly can. So if you want to collect some wax and make a candle, go for it. You, you notice some of the first frames we pulled out were just uh, honey. So if you want to harvest some honeycomb from your hive, you can do that from any beehive, be it a flow hive or, or top bar or conventional Langstroth. If you want to harvest some honeycomb, go for it. There's some beautiful uh, honeycomb there that you could harvest. You could squash the wax up, make some candles, do make a nice project with the kids and um, away you go. Yeah, the other thing worth saving, especially this hive is too young to have it, but you'll get a lot of propolis and you can see some down here. And every now and then you'll need to remove this. So it looks like what they've done here is they've tried to make a beetle jail to confine those beetles, but this propolis over time, it'll gum up really, like it'll eventually gum everything up if you don't start scraping away, but don't throw it away, like save it. It's really useful. I, I do judo and my hands are getting torn up all the time. And you can make some really nice hand creams with it. It sort of glues your skin back together. It, it does have health benefits as Yeah, absolutely. Well. Yeah, it's um, really so good. some beekeepers are nibbling it while they're working. Mm. <laughs> if, I, if I've uh, got a bit of a sore throat or something, I go and get a COVID test first. I'm just of course. That. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I... Um, uh, might chew on a bit of that propolis. It turns into like a chewing gum in your mouth. Really different to chewing on beeswax. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's quite um, medicinal. It has a bitter resiny flavour because they're collecting that from the sap of trees. So at my place we've got a lot of pine trees and they'll collect the pine sap. Oh, so yeah. you have that piney kind of flavour to your propolis. <laughs> but there's probably as many different flavours of propolis as there are flavours of honey. I think there depending be. on what sap there they're going after. Actually the native bees caught me out um, because they collect a lot of propolis. They don't use wax so much. They Native stingless bees use propolis to um, make little bags to hold their honey in. And I thought this beautiful clear liquid in one of those bags was 
um, was honey. So I dipped my finger in and, and put it in my mouth and I was wrong. It was actually a store of resin they'd made. They'd been collecting resin wow. um, from, I didn't realize they would fill a pot up with pure resin pure to resin. make propolis with later on. Wow. Um, but I put that in my mouth and it was pure pine resin. Oh. And I didn't have water with me or anything. It was, oh, it was, <laughs> it was quite the experience, let me tell you. <laughs> so talking about the Australian sugar bag bee, which has been harvested by the Aboriginal people here for the last uh, 80,000 years or so and it's still being harvested today up in the northern parts of Australia in traditional ways. So we have the oldest living culture of honey harvests, harvesters here in Australia. Still going. Yeah. Fantastic. And Cormac, you, um, I believe you, um, you know, there's obviously different gifts you can get from a hive, it's not just honey. And that you um, took off a super and had some unripe honey and used it to make mead. How, how did you go about that? Yeah, so one of the things we do in Canberra is we tend to run double brood boxes on our flow hives. And then it makes it really easy to pack down for winter. You just pull the flow super off in winter and drain out whatever honey's left. And sometimes you do have some unripened honey in there. And we had that this year. So rather than try and stop that by freezing the honey or something, we said, well, look, we're going to run with it and one of the local meaderies came to the party and helped us make mead out of the, out of the honey, which is a really ancient drink. Uh, it's a, one of the Vikings uh, created mead and it was lovely. So it, it sells out unfortunately really, really quickly. So the Parliament gift shop has a whole <laughs> range of, of bee products now, but the mead, and then we ended up making honey vodka and the honey vodka is lovely. I'm not a huge vodka drinker, but this, this is, I must admit, it's quite nice. Um, and we sell the honey as well when we have a surplus. So the main reason we keep the bees at Parliament is to showcase sustainability. It's all about showcasing that sustainable gardening, about reducing pesticides. But the gifts are nice. Um, and we figured out that uh, a lot of the people, we do give gifts to VIPs when they visit, um, including, of course, Stuart when he comes up to do, <laughs> do, do demonstrations. But well, we found that some of them couldn't bring honey back home. They had biosecurity systems in place. They weren't like South Africa, for instance. But all of those people can bring back uh, pasteurized alcohol. So that's the other reason we did that. Um, it means that we can give some, everyone a gift from somewhere in the hive. Oh. Yeah, it's kind of nice. That's, so that's fantastic. There's yeah. so many gifts from the hive, isn't there? And we've got 30 hectares of garden around wow. Parliament. So we like those bees are absolutely foraging in those gardens first and foremost um, the gardeners are fantastic they use if something called integrated pest management so they are basically got a greenhouse that's dedicated to make it's essentially a monster house it produces predators that they release through the garden instead of sprays oh, a monster house that's yeah so fantastic so what about you know the, the, the just your regular um gardener who doesn't have a monster house, what can they do um, about pest management within their gardens and looking after their bees? Yeah, I, th I think in the same way that a beehive draws you into this completely new world that's really fascinating, your garden can do much the same. And what I always try and tell people is try and understand what's happening in your garden. So if you see a pest on your tomatoes, let's say you see a caterpillar, think, is that actually doing harm? Because that caterpillar is not just a potentially a pest for me. If there's one or two of them, it's not gonna eat enough to harm the tomato crop, but it is gonna feed a predator. And the predators must have food to build up and they then take care of your, of your pests for you. And a lot of it's about understanding that interplay in your garden. It doesn't mean you don't spray ever, but when you do spray, try and always, always, always use a non-residual spray, something that doesn't reside in your garden for a long time. And this is why there's a class of chemicals called neonicotinoids. Once you spray that on a bush, it will stay on that bush for around about seven years and sometimes longer. And any bee foraging off that bush will also pick up the toxin. So the systemic pesticides are kind of a big no-no, but also it's kind of like using a bazooka in your home garden. Like you don't, you don't need to use such a powerful chemical. You'll generally find, what I say to people is, what am I trying to achieve with my garden? Do I really need to have a compest? Because I love having praying mantises around. And that means you've got to have something for the praying mantises to eat. You know, you've got to have your predatory wasps even. Wasps are not always bad. They're sometimes really, really good. 
especially if you don't like spiders. If you don't like spiders, you want to keep the mud dauber wasps around because that's what those mud, little mud houses, they're stuffed full of zombified spiders. So if you hate spiders, look after your wasps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. That's so good. I love it um, that uh, when people become new beekeepers, they tend to open their eyes to, to this yeah. whole interconnected world and all of yeah. a sudden it becomes important to, to not spray insecticides. Yeah. It becomes important to look after the, the local area. Mm. And then you get this effect of all of these beekeepers being a node for looking after our environment for not only the European honeybees, but of course all of the native bees that are all around mm. and in, uh, so important to the very world we depend on. So it's certainly something that keeps us going is, is just spreading the word but I think you've said yourself in response to questions on these lives, like people say, what do I do about my neighbours? Like, give them a jar of honey. But say to them, hey, I'm keeping bees. Look, it'd be wonderful if you could not spray. You know, if you could help me look after my bees and they're going to pollinate your, your veggie patch. So when I started keeping bees, I told the neighbours and then all the neighbours immediately shifted their veggie patch right next to where the hive was. So we've got like a little hub with my hive in the middle now um, of all of our veggie patches. Uh, so they, they, they are really on board, but it helps, you can be, you can influence people a lot more than you think. Yeah, Particularly with a jar of honey. Absolutely. And uh, <coughs> here she is. So yeah, just see. beautiful. Looks nice and healthy there. Look at that. It's amazing the different strides she has. She's in a bit of an erratic mood just now, but as she gets back into uh, realizing that everything's okay, She'll slow down a little bit, but her strides are bigger than the worker bee. And she's got that big, long abdomen full of eggs and she's laying away. So this um, isn't one of the, the uh, requeened hives. That's the original one that came with the swarm because the queens we recently put in, well, I didn't put them in, but um, have a mark on them. Beekeepers who breed queens will often put a paint mark right on the thorax there on that shiny back plate So it becomes easy to see the queen, but not only that you can color code it for the year and learn how long your queens are lasting Fantastic. We've had an um, interesting fact come in here Cormac when you were talking about the Vikings um, Chris is saying he'd thought the same thing, but he went back in that the Chinese had been making it long before the Vikings Wow, yeah <laughs> yeah, okay. I was wrong. I mean, you learn something every so day. This, uh, this is what our flow hive people tell us. We've, um, I mean, it's just fantastic. We've got people coming in from Italy, and someone literally just down the road um, at Cooper Shoot. So we've got from Italy to Cooper Shoot, which is down the end of our road. She's a bit concerned that there's apparently we've got big, strong rain and wind coming this weekend, and should she do anything to protect her hive? Yeah, um, w we find that having having a strap around the hive just uh you know just go to bunnings or one of the other shops and just have a strap that goes around the hive we'll keep it together that's really really useful we have um, one of the other things i keep bees on tall rooftops on the tops of buildings in the city and they're subjected to really extreme wind and occasionally one will get blown over and the strap is what keeps everything together so that, that helps everything and if you do find generally a hive is so heavy that it's very very hard for it to um very hard for it to be blown over but if you do get really extreme wind the strap will mean that it doesn't get damaged yeah stop it from falling apart um, we've had such extreme weather it's also been very hot and so a few people are saying a lot of their bees have been hanging on the outside of their hive and just wondering is that is that usual on these really hot nights it certainly is that's called bearding and it's a really it's one of the things i most love about bees because oh look she's she's checking out a cell getting ready to just in there. She's just inspecting a cell now. She'll probably lay an egg, I think, if it's acceptable. So what that means in a practical sense is make sure your hive's got water. Because what's happening there is, um, this is fantastic. She's about to lay an egg, I think. Yeah, it means that you're, they're picking up water and they're spitting it to the outside of the hive and then they're fanning their wings to, to evaporate that water off and then the cool air from the evaporated water 
then cools the hive down. And also there's less heat from the bodies because they're, they're outside the hive. So what it means is they need water as a critical resource. So if you see that happening, it's always a, a, a tell for you to immediately go and check that they've got a source of water that they can pick up from. So we did just witness the queen laying an egg, but she got covered up by bees right at the, uh, the moment. But what she did was dip her abdomen right down the cell. She wants to put the egg right at the bottom of the cell. She's and she's checking out the checking cell, out now, cell with her now. Head, so she's making sure it smells right. And the workers should have let her know that it's clean by leaving it fresh and clean. And um, so she's got her head out of the cell now. Moving over it, maybe. Is it acceptable? I don't know if she's going to... Yeah, shade on there. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a bit of shade for her. No, she's moved on. No, it wasn't she's clean enough. <laughs> that's it. Not acceptable. <laughs> Clean your room, that's what you're saying. So the workers actually leave a pheromone in the cells to say, this cell's clean. It's a bit like the door hanger on the hotel room. <laughs> um, <laughs> look at that, it's fantastic to watch, isn't it? If you don't learn something new every time you open up a hive, then you're probably not looking hard enough. It's this never ending <laughs> learning journey, isn't it? It really is. Few people are wondering is that a few waggle dancers going on as well? It certainly it is. is. Yeah, there's quite a few in here, so it's quite an active hive. I find that fascinating, just the way they can communicate in the dark, in amongst oh, oh, yeah. fifty thousand bees. There's hardly any room. How do they communicate such accurate information? Because for me I find it's much more than how far and and the direction the the forage is in it's actually in my case when I was doing a lot of making a big mess inventing the flow hive uh, you'd, you'd find I'd leave the roller door open in the shed we lived in and the bees would come come and uh, find the, the honey experiment I was working on <laughs> go back to the hive and tell the others and then all of a sudden there's 10 bees 20 bees 100 bees and you go well better close that roller door and then what happens is all those bees come and buzz around the roller door, even though I've opened up the window to let the bees out, which is right next to it. And it takes another hour or two before the bees figure out that they can go in. So that tells me that the information is so accurate, they're telling you door, window, and things yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. They give yeah. you very, yeah. very precise way. coordinates, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it's incredible the language of the honeybee. We've got so much to learn about it, but it's amazing that we've managed to decode it to actually understand distance and also direction in relation to the sun and so on. And if you do a little bit of study, you can work it out too. Watch some waggle dances and learn to decode the language of the honeybee. Now, I'm holding here because this is a, a foundationless frame. There's no, no plastic foundation in the middle. There's no wax and wire foundation. So as, um, as we tipped it up for the camera, I just put my fingers on the bottom of the comb here to make sure it wasn't going to break off. Good, I should have done, should have thought of that. <laughs> so generally you don't hold the comb, you know, flat, horizontal like this. We've no. Done it, we've done it for you and for the camera, but generally you hold it uh, vertically and um, and over the hive too, because you don't want the queen to drop off onto the grass below and you yeah. lose her. She probably won't, but just in case, you generally do that. How, how heavy is that frame, Cedar? Is it a couple of kilos? or No, yeah, this um, is quite light. a full frame of honey can be a couple of kilos, but because we've got a lot of brood in here, the brood doesn't weigh as much. So we've just got a little bit of honey at the top, and you can tell the difference between honey and brood by the capping here, and you quite quickly get your eye in. It can be light like this with, with white or yellow cappings when it's fresh or it can be really dark. But the brood looks quite different. If I um, brush away some of these bees here, you'll see the difference between the brood, which is more of a, um, not quite so translucent, the capping. And that's what it looks like there. So it doesn't take long to get your eye in to work out what's what. Of course, if you want some in-depth training material, you can head over to thebeekeeper.org, go to a bee course, 
do some research online, read bee books. It's a fantastic thing to get immersed in the world of bees. Uh, their pitch just changed a bit there. Yeah, 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 there we are. That's what I got. Just heard the. So what we were just saying is that we suddenly noticed the change in the hum, in the buzz of the bee, and some of them buzzing around my head, and so they've suddenly got a bit sick of it. The winds come up; they don't like mm. their hive being open on the windy, windy day. That unsettles them. Plus, it's been open for quite a while now, so give yeah. them a bit of smoke to settle them down, that, and that way, the alarm-making ones, the, the guard bees and the sentry bees, and those looking out for that sort of thing, their pheromones will get masked a bit by the smoke, so the rest of the hive won't suddenly launch at you. But also, it's probably time to close the hive up. They're, they're getting, they're on that edge of being upset. We've seen the queen. We've seen that the eggs are healthy. If the brood pattern for some of you who might have been watching isn't <coughs> isn't really consistent right across the frames but it's not a disaster either so it's a hive to just keep an eye on in terms of the queen being a consistent and good layer and um, thank you and meanwhile we'll probably put it back together again just because you know you hear that change in tone um, I think Cormac knows it well just just as we do because <laughs> You leave it a little bit longer and you get stung somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Stung somewhere, so it's a little alarm for us as well. Um, but it's really saying, yep, the hive's on the begin at the beginning of feeling stressed. It's time, to, time to put it back together if you can. You know, you may not, depending on what you're doing, you may not be able to. Um, but certainly, if you dress like me, you should. Yeah, Stu's <laughs> going to give us a demonstration of when the hive tone changes. <laughs> <laughs> How fast you need to if, run? If you stand in front of the entrance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the things in the, sci the scientific program we run at Parliament, um, we've been we've been experimenting with online sensors as well that listen into the hum of the bees, ah, and that's wow. quite fun. It means I can monitor them remotely, so I can sort of check my hives off my phone right now, if I wanted to. Um, that yeah, is fun. Fun. yeah, it is kind of nice. It also means if there's any, for instance, people saying high wind, if the hive does get tipped over, it, it has a, a, a accelerometer that tells me that there's a, there's a problem. Ah, wow. Yeah, so it'll tell me, it, it's mainly designed for against bear attack because it's designed for North American conditions. Yeah. So bears tend to knock hives over when they attack them. Um, so it's designed for that. Oh, you can definitely, if you come in, you can definitely hear the change in the, in the hum now. You probably uh, smell the alarm. That extra smoke, right? so yeah, agitates them that agitates moment. them. But that, and I find that the pitch gets deeper and deeper, the less happy they are. It's like a growling dog when a really when a really angry hive. It, it's like it sounds a lot like a dog growling, and it's exactly the same thing. It's them saying, "Go away! I don't know who you are. I don't want you near me." So, so what I'm doing now is moving the frames back together so we can slide that last frame in without. Uh, rolling any bees or squashing it and uh, so we've got everything back together we we'll put it all back in the same way sometimes it's nice to leave this little bits of burkoam that way you know which way the frame goes back in and uh, you only really need to scrape it off the first frame you're taking out or you might choose to scrape it right off the top here save some wax for a candle or what have you and uh, if that way some beekeepers like to keep it whistle clean on top so it's a bit easier to get the excluder off and so on. Others like to leave a bit of wax around because the bees do recycle it and use it where they're needed. Mm -hmm. We've got time for a couple more questions. Yeah, Cormac, um, a couple of people in Australia are obviously saying are the hives that you look after at Parliament House, are they open to the public? Sort of. Um, we do occasionally run tours, very occasionally, but it's, um, it's in a sort of a less visited part of the garden, so they're not inside the security cordon, but we generally try not to, uh, we just basically don't have time, because again, it's, it's something I do for a bit of fun in, yep. my, in my after hours, so uh, especially when we have major events like Science Meets Parliament, because we do have a scientific program, we run public tours then, uh, but other times of the year, like World Bee Day, where, where Stuart's come down We'll sometimes have people in suits to have a look at the hives then, but generally we just don't have enough suits, and um, we don't have enough suits by spare basically to, to let that many people around them. 
The other thing is our hives are quite close to a retaining wall which has got a four meter drop down onto a, a, a 80 kilometer per hour roadway. <laughs> so that's the, the hives are absolutely, it's, like it's like the brown snakes. Like uh, the professional beekeepers probably consider brown snakes to be the most dangerous thing, but I don't. Um, the, the roadway is the most dangerous thing I have to deal with. <laughs> the 80 kilometer drop for the beehive. Yeah, yeah. yeah you definitely that, don't want to fall. Putting that super and back on, oh, trying not to squash yep. any bees, using the smoker to get them to move away. And away we go. Nice okay. Work. What about Cormac in terms of biosecurity? Um, one of our beaks have come in and said, you know, we don't get. Um, eventually will we get mites in Australia? And if we do, what what will sort of biosecurity do to try and stop that from happening or other pests and diseases as well? Yeah, so I'm, I'm part of the uh, the team that manages one of the Sentinel Hive programs. So it's the bee, the bee Pest Bee Surveillance Program. Come on girls, off we go, off we go. Off, 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 thank you. Um, so all ports in Australia, uh, all ports of entry have beehives set up. Uh, as well as catch boxes for we catch the swarms that may have come off shipping containers. We also inspect the shipping containers when they come in, but I run the ones around Canberra Airport and we intensively check them for mites and they're the first line of defence. And the, the thinking is that if mites were to come into Australia, that's the first place they'd arrive and we'd, we'd detect them then. What we would do then, and we've had several incursions of mites in Australia, and each time we've put a cordon around, we've done, done, done intensive testing, and we've managed to contain them. So we have actually had mites in Australia, but because we've got a good biosecurity system, they haven't established. They've never been able to establish um, from those port incursions. And I hear a lot of people say that, you know, it's a question of when, not if, when they get into Australia. I, I really, really don't agree with that at all. It's not a question of when. We've been, may, been able to I work on biosecurity as part of my previous work with the Department of Environment. Like we've kept fire blight out, we've kept a lot of the crazy ants out of, um, out of Australia. We've had some incursions of fire ants, we've got them quite well contained. So this idea that it's just inevitable, that's completely defeatist. We can totally keep the mites out of Australia. Thank that, that. Lovely to hear that. That's yeah. really, really, really yeah. important work. And uh, hopefully, if we do get a bit of a spread at some point, the, the flow hives can be an asset because we have a tray underneath that mm. you could detect mites on. So yeah. we, we preempted that uh, in the beginning, thinking that, well, if there is an outbreak, we want to have the same uh, technology that they use a lot in America, which is to count mites on your pest management tray under here. And in New South Wales now, it's a requirement for every beekeeper to do a, um, to do a mite count every year so even though we don't have mites in australia by getting everyone to do what's called a sugar shake test which is kind of fun anyway you you cover the bees in sugar it makes them furiously angry but also delicious so <laughs> once you shake them out uh you then see the mites because the mites can't hang on to a bee when it's coated in sugar so it's a really really useful test and uh, by requiring that it means that we don't just have the sentinel teams that i'm part of looking for the mites we've got everyone looking for mites at least once per year it's a really good chance for us to keep them out completely, or if they do get in, to at least detect where they're going. Fantastic, and, and we will do a demonstration of that for everybody as well. Um, it is kind of fun. It is the most fun of the tests we do. The other tests are much more intrusive, and unfortunately they do result in killing <coughs> bees, but the sugar shake test is hilarious and actually surprisingly effective. It has a 90% uh, test fidelity, so it's, it's very, very effective. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Thank you very much for joining us here. With, uh, Cormac Farrell, all the way from Canberra. He's an educator, keeps bees on Parliament House. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to have him here today. Thank you very much for your questions. If you've got more, put them in the comments below and Cormac will spend all night answering them. Absolutely, yeah, that's for sure, totally. Yeah, absolutely, I've got nothing better to do. I'm actually on, on holiday, so I'm just <laughs> loving this, this apiary. It's, this is the, absolutely the most beautiful apiary I think I've ever seen. We just find they make so much more honey if they've got a view. Exactly, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and better quality honey too, you know. <laughs> Relaxed bees. Prime real estate here. <laughs>